pleasure to introduce today to you Dr. Steve Niederer, who's coming to us from King's College London. Um, Steve is a good friend of mine and a long time uh, friend in research. We've uh, sort of written papers together, uh, seen each other at many conferences. Steve actually is a New Zealander. He was born there and got his um, degree there at the University of Auckland, a uh, degree in engineering sciences. And then he got his PhD at the University of Oxford. And after that, he received a very prestigious award from the Engineering Council in UK um, prior to becoming a professor at King's College in 2008. Is that oh, correct? 10, 10. 2010, and since he's moved there very quickly to the ranks, and now he's a professor there. He has a pretty large lab that focuses mostly on translational research in the heart, particularly how to use computational modeling, um, <coughs> imaging to inform decisions that the clinicians could make for better treatment of patients. And um, he will talk to us about three Ds, drugs, diagnosis, and diseases. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, so I wanted to kind of begin this talk uh, with kind of an introduction. I apologize to kind of set the scene. So we have computational modeling. And so every time I used to go and see Natalia, she would have uh, had a, a, more of an adventure back in Tulane. Uh, so this is, I often showed these pictures. So the main way, way that most of us interact with computational modeling is about predictions and predictions of weather. And the simulations that we have for the weather are kind of combining information about kind of local ground stations, satellites, multi-scale information, and combine this into a single representation. And the idea is essentially that we can use models to predict uh, the data that we're going to get tomorrow, today. That we can predict information that we cannot observe so we can have a better understanding of what's driving these systems. And also that we can integ in integrate our multi-scale measurements to put all of this information into one place. So this is kind of the, the, the idea of, of where we see kind of modeling and kind of is a reasonable use case for us to think about. And so when we think about modeling of the heart, we kind of, it's a multi-scale problem. So I have a small child, and so most mornings this is me. And uh, you have your kind of your coffee, which is your, your coffee molecule here, which is about 500 picometers across. And that's something which is going to have an effect on your whole body on the kind of meter scale. And that m compound is going to go through your stomach, uh, through your blood vessels, maybe in a millimeter, through your heart at 10 centimeters. It's going to bind to the cardiomyocytes, go into the cardiomyocytes at about 100 microns. It's going to go through subcellular structures at kind of 20 micron or 2 micron level, go through the membrane, bind to the randomly receptor, and if you have enough coffee, it will eventually alter your kind of protein expression itself through mRNA. So this is kind of the gambit of multi-scale that we're looking for and how we're, what information we're trying to integrate. So we'd like to have an understanding or at least an analogy of what would it mean for a, something which was 4 billion times smaller uh, than a person, which is a drug affecting the body, what would be four, time, four billion times smaller than the globe that would then affect the whole weather system? So what is the scale, what's a, a comparable scale for the problem? So as Natalia said, I'm from New Zealand, and this is how all New Zealanders view the globe. <laughs> uh, very, very New Zealand-centric. Uh, and so it's about 13 million meters across. So four billion times smaller. New Zealand is 10 times smaller than the globe at 1.5 million meters across. And if you spend enough time on Google Earth, you'll eventually find a picture of yourself. <laughs> uh, so this is me hiking the Kepler track as the man with the giant Google ball uh, ran past us. About 1.8 meters, so I'm 650,000 times smaller than the globe. And if you look at the width of my glasses, they're three millimeters thick uh, for, the, for the lenses, and that's what four billion times smaller than the globe is. So when we're thinking about the problem of saying how we're going to simulate how a drug is affecting the whole body, it's the same kind of question of saying, how are we looking at something that's three millimeters across is affecting the global weather? So it's a, it's a non-negligible non problem. And so we do this with, by building multi-scale models. And so we start by thinking of the heart. We have an activation pattern. Uh, so the sinoatrial node depolarizes, activates the atria for activating the ventricles. This electrical signal is carried by the cells where we have ion, uh, pro membrane-based proteins allowing ions to move in and out of the cells conducting that electrical signal. They link into the calcium dynamics where they're going to induce a chemical signal in the cytosol. Calcium binds to the sarcomeric proteins leading to cross bridge attachment and the generation of force. And that is going to then lead to a generation uh, of mechanics. 
this is our standard kind of electric system mechanics framework, but as we kind of think about broadening this to look at different pathologies, all of these have provided energy through the mitochondria, so that's something that we like to include in our models. The tissue that the cells are located in, the extracellular matrix, that's going to be important for the stiffness and the preferential conduction properties. And then all of this is then driven by a number of layers of omics, which we're trying to increasingly include in our models so we can start to represent changes in protein expression in the mRNA and regulatory networks for determining how the system works. So the first problem I want to talk about was uh, a project we've been doing. We've been looking at how to modern a drug, and that drug is uh, doxorubicin and looking at its cardiotoxic effects. So doxorubicin is a very common uh, chemotherapy uh, that people get. It was discovered in 1967. There were early trials by 1969 on kind of order of 10 patients. Meta-analysis in 1974, where it kind of, kind of recognized as a potential therapy for cancer. And by 1976, it was then being associated with cardiotoxicity. So it's still used today. It's very widely used. Uh, and you still have patients that are still coming down with uh, cardiotoxic effects. And one of the questions we have is, why is, this a cardio why is this compound cardiotoxic? How is it cardiotoxic? Can we mitigate the downside for the patients who are currently taking this drug? Can we design new drugs which don't have the same side effects? And so as more patients survive chemotherapy, there's a greater number of people who are then going to have experienced these side effects. And so we've seen a growth in cardiac oncology clinics. And Jack had a cardiac oncology new journal that was coming out. So it's a growing area of interest. Uh, this is an example of showing kind of one of the problems that we have with the treatment is that it manifests itself at extremely long time, or potentially very long times, after the compound has been given. This is obviously a, 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 kind of a, a kind of sensational example. It's not representative of all cases. But 17 years is an incredibly long time after you've taken a drug to have a side effect. So the drug is gone. So we're now saying, how have you had a drug which has changed your physiology in some way such that 17 years later, it manifests as a, as a heart failure? There's no great animal models, and so every few years a new animal model is proposed, uh, which addresses one concern while creating others. And if we think about the, the duration of experiments, uh, here are the kind of standard rabbit experiments people do. They're all about eight weeks long uh, for doxorubicin. This is the change in left ventricular mass in patients since they were diagnosed, and it bottoms out at about 10 years. So it's about 12% of a human lifespan, whereas eight weeks is about 2% of a rabbit lifespan. So there's no kind of analogy or linear scaling to say that you're looking at comparable times between these animals. So this is really a problem where we also have, oh sorry, there's also a, a large amount of data characterizing this problem. So it's a problem which in many ways we looked at as, as right for computational modeling. It is uh, important, there's lots of data, and it's experimentally intractable. Uh, so this is where we started to look at this problem. So we began by, by noticing, or at least the framework that we were considering this in, was that the doxorubicin goes into your heart, it goes into your myocyte, and then it's preferentially found in mitochondria, and it's so associated with mitochondrial toxicity. And so we were able to use uh, this uh, mitochondrial model, which came from, from Hopkins, uh, which importantly had the reactive oxygen scavenging uh, components in it, as well as the electron transport chain and the TCA cycle. So we took this off the shelf as a model that we could then start to use to interrogate some of the experimental data that was available. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to test different hypotheses that people have put forward. So normally what happens in an experimental study is someone has a method that they're good at, they make a measurement, they see a significant change, and then they create a story to say how their significant observation explains the pathology. And it, and it may do, but you end up with multiple hypotheses and often they don't compare or test against the other ones. So we were looking at different mechanisms for causing uh, long-term uh, toxicity in the mitochondria from doxorubicin. So the first case was that people had observed that doxorubicin binds to complex one of the electron transport chain, and this increases reactive oxygen species production. Reactive oxygen species production is bad. This is a potential mechanism. The next observation was that doxorubicin also combined to cardiolipin, this is the protein which structurally holds together the complexes of the electron transport chain. This can cause electron transport chain dysfunction. This can cause reactive oxygen species production, but also reactive oxygen species production can in turn alter electron transport chain. And the last hypothesis that we looked at was uh, that doxorubicin can alter mitochondrial DNA content, that that can in turn decrease your electron transport chain function, and that can then alter ROS production, but ROS production can also alter your mitochondrial DNA content. And so from an engineering perspective, if someone tells you that there is going to be an input to a system and then it is going to have a slow change over a long period, then what you're looking for is a feed-forward system or a feed-forward loop. 
and there are two feed forward uh, feedback loops in this system, uh, which we'll call hypothesis one and hypothesis two. One is that the interaction between ROS production and electron transport chain sets up a feed forward, loop, uh, a forward feedback loop, uh, or that the kind of interactions with mitochondrial DNA cause a forward feedback loop. So we then had to go about making models of these. Which Kind of for complex one, we could shift the flux of complex one to produce more reactive oxygen species in the presence of doxorubicin. We could look at specific dose response curves for the presence of doxorubicin and the function of each of the electron transport chain complexes. And then for mitochondrial DNA, we had a problem in that mitochondrial DNA is, is known to repair itself. There are a number of ways in which mitochondrial DNA can repair itself. These are really poorly uh, described, and we're well, not poorly, they are qualitatively described. So that does not give us a lot of data to make a quantitative model. So we went back and we looked at making a relatively phenomenological model where we could represent DNA repair, which was based on an assumption that DNA repair was in a function of the amount of damage the DNA, mitochondrial DNA had received, and that it had a saturating rate. And so we could make a, a hill curve, which had a, a saturating curve for that. We introduced a uh, mitochondrial DNA damage due to reactive oxygen species presence and uh, made a model that would represent doxorubicin induced mitochondrial DNA damage. So we then had a mathematical representation of these three hypotheses, and we could go about adding these into our models. For the mitochondrial DNA, we could parameterize that in a lovely study done uh, by this Dutch group, where they started off by giving the uh, animals seven saline injections, and they found no loss in the mitochondrial DNA over 48 weeks. They then gave seven daily doses of doxorubicin and then waited 48 weeks and found a significant loss in mitochondrial DNA. They then did no intervention, seven daily doses, got a moderate loss. No intervention, 41 weeks, one dose, got almost no loss. No intervention and 41 weeks and six days with one dose and almost no loss. So it provided us with a series of time since dosage and dose response, which we could then use to constrain the parameters of our mitochondrial DNA damage model. So the first thing we did was we said, well, we'll put our mechanism one and mechanism two to test hypothesis one into the model. We could simulate what the anticipated doxorubicin exposure would be to the myocytes and predict how that would change different readouts, of ATP, <coughs> reactive oxygen species production, O2 consumption for the mitochondria model. And essentially, we were looking for two things. The first thing was, if you're giving a drug and it causes a long, sustained change in the uh, function, even as the concentration of doxorubicin decays away, and that would suggest that it was possible to cause a longer term uh, pathology. Or if it caused a fundamental state shift, so that we were at one stable equilibrium, we gave the drug and we moved to another one, then by moving to another equilibrium state, that might be more susceptible to other pathologies, might be less robust, and so that would also be a plausible explanation that this drug could be causing the toxicity. And as we see here, that no matter how much doxorubicin we added in, we had four different concentrations, everything decayed away back to the equilibrium state with these. However, once we added in the mitochondrial DNA damage, uh, and these are the data that we fitted the curves to, we see that we get a sustained uh, pathology, that after, once you have this mitochondrial DNA damage, you can actually have a very long-term and very slow decay, or if you have a high concentration, you can have a rapid fall off and collapse of the mitochondrial system. We were interested in why this could be the case. Uh, and so if we look at kind of along a line of kind of normalized mitochondrial DNA content, the less mitochondrial DNA content you have, the more reactive oxygen species production you will have. And as you have more reactive oxygen species production, you'll have more mitochondrial DNA damage. The rate of that damage will increase. But as you, de as you move along the spot, if you have a very high mitochondrial DNA content, you'll have a very low repair rate. And as that grows, uh, as your DNA content decreases, you'll have a higher and higher repair rate until it eventually saturates. And the saturation is what the key point there is. Because eventually you have a net change in DNA where at this point your DNA will be decreasing because you have a surplus. At this point you'll be in equilibrium. At this point you'll be recovering. At this point you will be collapsing. And when you do a phase analysis of this, you can find that you have a stable region where in this region you will kind of have a stable point that you'll kind of return to. But if you get pushed down below a critical point, your repair saturates, it can no longer recover from the DOS, uh, DOS dam ROS damage, and your mitochondrial DNA will be in an internal decline, it will collapse. This provides in a plausible, not absolute truth, but a plausible mathematical explanation out of all those three hypotheses to explain how DOS can be fixed. The thing that was interesting to us is that there's actually a drug you can give which reduces the mitochondrial DNA damage 
when you're receiving uh, doxorubicin. And that intends to be co-administered so that you have it at the same time that you have your doxorubicin and they both get finished at the same time. From this, we would say that actually if you took that drug for another six months after your doxorubicin had been, uh, fit, your course had finished, that might reduce your chances of having a, a later stage doxorubicin uh, heart failure or toxicity. So we're now looking at how we can do this in at least in a mouse model um, to see if we get kind of the, these results show that if you have susta uh, sustained uh, iron chelators after you finish your doxorubicin treatment that your, your mitochondrial DNA damage is less. So this was the first thing on drugs and so changing gear, that's a summary, uh, looking at the atria and this is not contrasted well at all. Uh, so these are the atria that we're looking at here and how we can go about making mathematical models of the atria. And so for the atria, we're particularly interested in how we can combine pre-procedural and post-procedural data. So pre-procedure, you have an ECG, you might have a CT, you might have an MRI. These are going to be characterizing the anatomy and the electrophysiology of the atria. And these are going to be the information based on some patient history that's going to determine if that patient is going to receive an ablation. And then what will happen is the patient goes into the cath lab, and this is our hospital, and some hospitals will be different. And we get electrograms during the procedure. We have an electroanatomical map, which gives us the anatomy during the procedure. And we have some fluoroscopy imaging. And all of the pre-procedure imaging data that's been acquired is not really used uh, massively for informing the therapy. And that the electroanatomical mapping is the primary information that is used for determining the procedures. And so there's a question about how can we better integrate the pre-procedure information that we have so we get the most out of that information when we're determining how these patients get treated. And so to do this, we had to kind of, that was our, our aspiration, so to do this, we had to build up a series of steps. We wanted to look at how we can better measure the ana anatomy of the atria. So the atrial anatomy is highly varied. We like to have a better idea of what type of tissue fibrosis we have in the atria, which gives a substrate for these arrhythmias. And we were kind of looking at the data that we had available, and most of the data we have available is MRA and LGE imaging. Uh, for characterizing both the anatomy of the atria and for characterizing the fibrosis score. So these are the, 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 the process that we uh, started with that our cardiologists had available to them. So the way we go about measuring the, uh, the fibrosis, we start with our MRA image. We then have a semi-automatic segmentation protocol, so the MRA is a better contrast for identifying where the endocardial wall is of the atria and makes it possible to do semi-automatic segmentation. We register the MRA to the LGE, so we can then move our segmentation done on the easier image to segment into the uh, LGE, which is where you can measure fibrosis. We then can make a shell uh, from that segmentation. We can crop that shell in standard locations to remove the pulmonary veins and uh, the mitral valve. And so if you have this done in a standard way, it reduces the variability in your numbers, so it means you can have smaller patient numbers and still get uh, reasonable results. Uh, we then do a projection of the algae voxels back onto the surface and look for the maximum intensity to get an idea of what the fibrosis burden will be, and then we can calculate our fibrosis score. So our thought process for doing this was that we would like to, uh, we started off and these things were all being done in about six different pieces of software. Some of them worked in Mac, some of them worked in Linux, some of them worked on Windows. Uh, there were MATLAB scripts, and the poor cardiologists were spending about an hour per case going between different systems trying to process them all. So now all of this is done in an MITK workflow, uh, so that kind of drastically increased the volume that we could go through and get cardiologists to process our data. And so once you've done that and made a workflow which cardiologists can process the data at scale, then we were able to get them to go away and process 200 of these cases while they were working nights. So once we had about 250 of these images where we had a label in the pulmonary veins and the segmentation of the mitral valve, we could then make a unit, train that on a GPU cluster, and then once we'd had these labels, we could then repeat the cropping that was done in our software so that we're doing exactly the same workflow, uh, but we'd now remove this manual step, and we could generate our fibrosis map. So this now becomes a fully automated pipeline so that you have your MRI image and you collect the fibrosis score and everything is done for you. So this drastically changes the scale and the speed of which you can run these simulations. We also wanted to know how, how good we were doing, and we didn't have an aspiration to be perfect, so the images aren't perfect, but we wanted to be better than a cardiologist, or at least as good. And so we had uh, four cardiologists repeat segment uh, 60 cases, and then that gave us an idea of how close one cardiologist is to another, so we have a dice score. And this is uh, the 
cardiologists, high quality cardiologists, other cardiologists when segmenting uh, the blood pool, when segmenting the mitral valve, and when segmenting the pulmonary veins. And then we can compare how close our uh, neural network is to doing the same segmentation process, comparing it to the cardiologist's results. And so for every single measure for the blood, for the valve, and the vein, we outperform the cardiologist. So the machine was closer to a cardiologist than another cardiologist would be. And so that gave us some confidence uh, that, we knew that we were getting repeatable results. And then we could also compare the fibrosis burden uh, that was measured from the cardiologist segmentation versus one coming out of the machine learning, so that we get a reasonable correlation uh, between the machine learning based fibrosis burden versus the uh, cardiologist. So the machine learning based fibrosis burden is independent of an operator. So it's 100% reproducible. Uh, we can have a conversation and a, a broader conversation about uh, image quality and reproducibility of image quality, and, but that's not my area. We're just trying to get, make sure that we're getting the, the software working. And so the other area we've looked at for this is for kind of broaden this out is we work with Siemens. Siemens uh, are reasonably good at providing segmentation code. And so they provide us with a machine learning based segmentation code for kind of characterizing the uh, four chamber heart. So we can get that from a cardiac CT, but what the benefit of this is it takes about two seconds to get a four chamber segmentation. Uh, cardiac CT, you're looking at a 500 slices, uh, would be pretty expected. And so our cardiologists are not prepared to manually segment those. Um, and, but that means we can then start making these virtual cohorts where we have standardized labeling uh, on all the different chambers and all the different sections, which really makes a framework for starting to say how can we do virtual patient trials, make large scale virtual cohorts that, that we can use for evaluating different devices or diagnostics. We also have the microstructure of the heart, so we know that our fibers are oriented, our cells are have an orientation, they're packed together with an orientation, they form layers with an orientation and wrap around the heart with a preferred orientation. So for our simulations, we'd like to look at how we can include this information in our models, and again, doing it quickly, doing it at scale. So the way we do this is we make uh, coordinate systems, which are defined both within the atria and within the ventricles. So we have a, an atrial coordinate system where we can go from the left and right atria down to two 2D squares. Uh, with alpha and beta coordinates. And we can then define fiber orientations within this coordinate structure. And once we've defined fiber orientations within this coordinate structure, we can then map those instantly onto any case that comes along once we've introduced this coordinate system into that patient's atria. And likewise for the, uh, for the ventricles. So when we do that, we can then start to add these kind of, kind of very pretty, and this is kind of our, our pretty heart figure, where we've looked at transmural variation in the fiber orientation in the left ventricles, we have the fibers wrapping around the pulmonary veins in the atria, and we have left and right atria fiber orientation. And we can do this onto any of these cases once we've generated these uh, coordinate systems, and it takes kind of on the order of minutes to do that projection. So the other thing we'd like to do, uh, so we have this kind of way of characterizing the anatomy of these atria and the fiber orientation, looking at the fibrosis. We'd also like to make a personalization of the electrophysiology. So normally, or in, in a kind of standard reduced representation of an action potential when a cell is electrically stimulated, the sodium channel is open, sodium comes in, we have a depolarization, calcium ions come in through the alpha calcium channel, sodium calcium, yes, calcium is then extruded through the calcium exchange, more sodium comes in, the cell repolarizes and potassium ions leave, and then the sodium potassium pump returns everything back to homeostasis. So this is a reduced representation. Uh, there are still, uh, well, we've got one, two, three, four, five proteins that we're going to be having to characterize there. Potentially 50, 60 parameters. We don't have this type of information locally on the tissue in patients. So we decided to make some drastic uh, reductions. Uh, and so we got rid of all of the complicated bits uh, to have just sodium channels and potassium channels. And the cell depolarizes and it repolarizes. So we used a Mitchell Schaefer model representation. We made a modification of this to make it more stable, but essentially we have ions flowing in and ions flowing out. These gates have uh, time constants, so we have four <coughs> time constants, and at each piece of tissue we have a conductivity tensor. So we were able to reduce down the electrophysiology representation to having five parameters at each point. And we'd like to work out how we can characterize those at a local region in a patient's heart during a procedure. And so we do this uh, this is a overlaid atria, and we have a one of the methods we use is using a decapolar catheter, which we see here. It's a catheter with 10 electrodes spaced along the length of it. We can approximate it as a 1D line. We have our 10 electrodes. We have distances that we know, and we can simulate this from the middle two electrodes and watch as the activation wave moves proximally and distally along that catheter. 
We have simulate this with an S1 and S2 protocols. So we're looking at trying to probe the dynamic response of the tissue. And for each of these different electrode pairs, we get a bipolar electrogram, which is going to give us an activation time, or a delay, a latest activation, a local activation time, as we pace with a, our S1 parameter, it's going to be an activation, and then as we pace with S2, there'll also be an activation time. And we can get this for all our different S2 combinations with different S1s. We can vary S1, we can vary S2. So it gives us a reasonably rich data set for characterizing both the conduction velocity restitution and effective refractory period restitution. So for those, we can take our measurements at each of these two electrodes, divide them by the delta x, and that's going to give us three conduction velocity restitution curves for different S1 values. In the electrograms, you don't have anything analogous to the T wave, so you don't know when the cell is depolarizing, or repolarizing, sorry. But you can look at when a stimulation might be occurring within the refractory period or within the action potential. And so if you don't see an electrogram, that's a good sign that the cell is refractory and you may be pacing within that action potential duration. So we look for the longest S2 where there is no local activation time, and that gives our effective refractory period. And that's going to give us our uh, effective refractory period restitution curve. So we can then use this to uh, fit our model, which is our uh, black line, uh, comparing that to our dashed line, which was measured, to give us an estimate of what the maker model, which captures both the conduction velocity restitution and effective refractory period uh, at a local point in the tissue. So for us, this was quite nice because it made a way which we could have some kind of uh, p local personalized electrophysiology model using data that we could collect uh, tractably in the clinic. But that was at a single point, and so we then wanted to look at how we can use for tissue. So we then moved to using a pentaray catheter, uh, which has 20 electrodes along uh, five spines, or separated on five spines. We are pacing from the coronary sinus and the high right atrium, and then we'll get about, depending on the case, 70 to 150 activation points per atria. And we then apply our S1 and S2 protocol. And for this, we'd use the coronary sinus measured activation map, and then we'd fit our model only to the data recorded when we uh, were, were pacing from the coronary sinus. We'd then use the model that we'd fitted to predict what those activation maps would be when we were pacing from the high right atrium. And then we can get an error distribution to characterize how accurate or, or kind of validate the model on this individual patient using the uh, measurements that we can make for that individual. And so for that, we've applied that to seven cases where we have kind of our fitting uh, data sets where each one of these is a S2 point. We have 28 S2 values for each of these cases. And then we can validate those against the uh, high right atrium measurements. And what this gives us is an ability to make uh, simulations of fibrillations in patients where we're capturing some of that spatial heterogeneity in the electrophysiological properties in the models. And we get much more complicated activation patterns than you might have got had you just assumed a homogeneous material property. Uh, so once we've done this, we then had a characterization of tissue properties. And we thought, well, making these maps, making these models is quite challenging in the clinic. And so the other idea we had was if we can make a characterization of the tissue properties in a particular region, can we say, are these regions pro-arrhythmic? Would they sustain an arrhythmia? So from that, we went, is this going to work? We went and we made, um, we take local tissue properties where we know what the cellular property or we can use the inferred cellular properties that we have, set up a spiral wave in each of these different regions and see which regions had tissue properties which were compatible with sustaining a reentrant activation pattern. So if you... A region can't sustain a reentrant uh, re re activation pattern. It's unlikely to be the driving region for the uh, atrial fibrillation. Whereas if it is capable of sustaining a reentrant activation, then it is possible that this is a target for ablation and this is a mechanism which is being used for driving the AF. And so we see you know, different regions. These are, these are five models made from five different regions, measurements we made in patients. And these, two, uh, these three break down, but these two are sustained. And so there is this kind of just separation of material properties for what will sustain the rhythm and what won't. However, validating this in a patient is difficult because mapping uh, reentrant activation patterns in patients, you either have a, to use a large catheter, which doesn't really give you a local measurement, or you have to make measurements and hope that that reentrant is going to be in the region you're looking at. So now uh, we went out, and this is difficult for me, we went out and raised money to get a uh, fluoroscopy, uh, sorry, a fluorescence imaging system. So we're now making fluorescence measurements on rat atria, we're going to rabbit, so we can start to measure the voltage and the tissue measurements of the uh, reentrant activation patterns. But then we can also make electrogram measurements locally from these models, or from these from the uh, atrial 
and then make mathematical models to represent the local atrial tissue and see if those are the regions which are sustaining the arrhythmia in these atria. Uh, so this is where we got up to. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was the work we're doing on heart failure. And so for this, we're looking at patients who are having synchronous heart failure. So in the healthy heart, we have atrial activation uh, coming down to rapidly attract the right and left ventricle, giving a synchronous contraction. In synchronous heart failure, we have a failure on the uh, left ventricular rapid activation. And we have much slower activation coming from the right to the left, and this makes the heart contract asynchronously and inefficiently. This is treated with uh, cardiac synchronization therapy where a lead is placed in the through the coronary veins into the left ventricle and into the right ventricle. And this then returns the heart to a synchronous activation. It augments the activation pattern. And it's great. It reduces mortality. It reduces hospital emissions. But it also has a response rate of, depending on how you measure these things, 40 to 60%. There's a reasonable cost per case. And there's a significant growth in the number of patients receiving this therapy. So there's questions about who will respond, why they will respond, uh, and can we improve the outcome? So we have these kind of distributions of controls and patients who receive CRT, and we see about kind of 32% of patients don't respond to therapy. And so we had a question as to why don't patients respond? Can we identify any kind of physiology that would explain why these cases aren't responding? So for this, we made a mathematical model of the heart. We started with uh, anatomical MRI, which we could then label that uh, the myocardium in the uh, in the MRI. And once we had that segmentation, we could register a template anatomical mesh to that segmentation to give us a representation of that patient's heart. So from there, we could then add in uh, physics to represent the physiology of that patient. So we could measure, well, we then simulate the activation pattern. We could simulate what the uh, right ventricular pacing with an asynchronous activation pattern would be. We could then introduce uh, our left ventricle act a left ventricle lead and simulate what the biventricular activation pattern will be for these patients. We can take mechanics measurements where we can combine both cine and tagged MRI to track motion uh, and then measure the material point displacements in the patient's heart, use this to constrain a mathematical model of the uh, passive stiffness and the active stiffness uh, so we can start to personalize the mechanics of this patient's ventricle. And we can combine this together with pressure measurements which will then allow us to simulate a beat of the patient's heart, and we can start moving it on. Nope. Oh well, that's a movie of a beating heart. And we can compare the pressure measurements which are simulated in blue, uh, and the volume transits in blue versus the invasive measurements we see in yellow, versus the MRI-based uh, volume transit that we see with the red-yellow boxes. So we have a model which we can then make a representation of a patient's uh, heart when they're having, uh, before they have their CRT, and start to predict how they will respond to CRT. So one of the questions we had was what are the, what's important for these patients? What, you can make a lot of measurements. What measurements could be more important for differentiating patient cases? Are there, are there specific parts of the patient's heart which will determine how they'll respond? So in our mathematical model, we have all these different parameters representing different attributes of the passive properties, of the active properties, of the electrical properties, of the boundary conditions. And we can perturb all of these and identify which ones of these the response to CRT is most sensitive to. And so the measure that they use in acutely is the acute hemodynamic response, which means when you turn on the pacemaker, what is the improvement in mechanical function in the heart with the CRT device on based, compared to the baseline value? And we found that the length dependence of active tension was the most sensitive parameter by a significant margin. So we were curious as to why this would be the case. So the length dependence of active tension comes from the Frank's Darling law. It says once you stretch muscle, it will contract harder and faster. And Normally, this is responded to increased venous return, means the heart pumps harder. So why would it have a role in dyssynchrony? And so when we have dyssynchrony, we have activation happens first in the septum before spreading to the lateral wall. So the septum starts to contract early and shortens, and the lateral wall is in stretch because this is happening during an isovolumetric contraction. So if we think about this in a, we throw, if we throw the model away, we put, make this a pure thought experiment. If we have an activation in the septum, our blue line will start to develop tension while our lateral wall will be quiescent and not be developing tension. Because we're in isovolumetric contraction, as the septum contracts, it becomes shorter and the lateral wall becomes longer. When the activation reaches the lateral wall, <coughs> the septum will be short, so it will have a slower turtle uh, contraction versus the lateral wall, faster rabbit contraction. And so the lateral wall will catch up, has the capacity to impart, catch up 
to the septum contraction. So here we've had desynchronous activation, but if we have a healthy Frank's darling mechanism, it is possible for the heart to synchronize itself. Now, if, which means we have a dissociation between the electrical asynchrony and the mechanical asynchrony. If we don't have a healthy Frank's darling mechanism, then there is no catch-up. So the septum will contract at the same rate as the lateral wall, and the mechanical desynchrony will be as great as the electrical desynchrony. And so if you can then resynchronize the electrical synchrony with CRT, we believe you'll have a far greater response. That's why you have a far greater response for your mechanical response to pacing. The challenge we found was that measuring uh, the Frank Starling mechanism in a patient is not done normally uh, and is not done easily. And so the suggestion we had was that you should do a leg elevation and measure the change in stroke volume following the leg elevation as the blood returns to the heart. And after three turns of trying to elevate the legs of an 80-year-old person with heart failure while trying to do an echo on someone who may not have the best echo windows, we decided this was not a practical solution uh, for a high-throughput uh, CRT clinic. So I'm very open to suggestions on other ways that we could use to measure this. Because uh, we think it's an interesting idea, it's just not easy to measure uh, in any feasible, uh, in any obvious way. Um, and the last thing was on lead position, which is kind of work that we're doing at the moment. I want to finish on something that was kind of, I thought was exciting and that we're working on now. And so you have these CRT leads, you can put the leads in lots of different locations. Where should you put the lead? And so this is a prediction problem. <coughs> and so we have a workflow where the patients will have a CT. We can track the motion and anatomy from the CT imaging. We can then make predictions on where to put the electrode. We can then put those into the CRT planning system. We go to the cath lab, identify where we'd like to put that electrode, and then we convey that information to the cardiologist during the procedure. So we had to make software which could do feature tracking to work out where, how, the cardiac, how the heart was contracting from CT images. We could then work out where the latest region to contract was. That has then been suggested as a potential target for CRT. We could use our anatomy use our cure restoration, use a rule-based fibers, use a rule-based electrophysiology model to make a EP model of that patient and then predict what the activation patterns will be as you pace from different locations to work out where the most synchronous activation pacing location would be. And then we can use that as a potential target for the CRT model. And the other thing we wanted to do was look out where we can measure infarct. And so CT doesn't have the equivalent to delayed enhancement, or it does, but it doesn't work reliably, uh, or not in our hands at least. And so we use perfusion CT, where we could get a map of the perfusion distribution for a patient. And we have a very low perfusion region here. And we had the analogous MRI that this patient had previously. We can see the infarct region from the late enhancement imaging. So this is a way that we can then get an idea about where low perfusion, potentially infarcted regions are in these patients from uh, a CT imaging. And these are regions we don't want to pace in. So we combine regions we don't want to pace in with the latest mechanical activated region with the optimal region based for based on activation and then we can provide the cardiologist with targets on the planning and this is what the cardiologist will see or overlaid on the fluoroscopy during the procedure. And so this is the uh, kind of prospective clinical, choose my wording carefully here, the prospective <coughs> clinical validation of the method uh, that will then kind of as a precursor to doing a more a broader trial. Uh, so. The work has been done by a large number of people, both within my group, uh, within King's College. We've had data from Maastricht. We have technical support from Ed Figment and Gernot Plank, who provide the CARP software, which all, the vast majority of the simulations were performed in. Uh, we work with people in Sheffield on the statistics for looking at how we can do uncertainty quantification in this work. Uh, and we take money from anyone who will give it to us. Thank you. All right. And so, um, one of the you know one of the uh, main points is the central role of iron yep. and the role of iron accumulator. So, how do you uh, plan on incorporating that to your model yep. beyond simply saying that iron is responsible for ROS production? Well, so we had a representation of fenton chemistry, which is a mapping of the kind of reactive oxygen species production interacting with iron leading to mitochondrial DNA. And so, we can effectively, if you have a black box, which is your kind of map from the reactive oxygen species goes through that fending chemistry and then leads to mitochondrial DNA. If you have measurements which characterize how changes in iron concentration 
are going to lead to a change in that mitochondrial damage as a function of mitochondrial DNA damage as a function of the uh, reactive oxygen species, we can then add that in as a transfer function into the model. Are there plans to extend so like there's doxes of bruce and cardiomyopathy, but um, also like an emerging problem is um, immunotherapy cardiotoxicity. Are there thoughts about trying to go in that space? So this particular project uh, was a five-year project um, where we had we have a few more papers that would come out on this based on exposing cells to doxorubicin and uh, stem cell measurements over a two-week protocol, and I think we have mass spectrometry, methylation, mRNA measurements. So that was a, a, a reasonably significant, a significant investment. I think there's space for using simulations to identify for, for any of these toxicity things, particularly when you have a transfer from an animal model or from an assay, trying to integrate that data together and make a prediction in humans, does it models at least provide a framework for doing that? We're not, out, out specifically, we're not looking at going to this immune, but it is certainly something I should think which would be susceptible to, to simulation. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I know you had, uh, because of time constraint, you had to gloss over the details. I'm trying to understand the uh, healthy uh, Frank Starling relation, which you say could explain this catch up phenomenon yep. of late activation, late activated myocardium. But that would require a faster time to peak, I would think, rather than just an increase in force. I mean, is the timing of, of force generation different? Is that part of what you meant? Or is it simply, I couldn't understand why simply an increase in force would allow the late mm -hmm. activation catch up in terms of timing. So it's both an increase in the peak force and the rate of which force is developed. Right. So the increased rate of force development would allow it to catch up versus a slower rate in the shorter regions. Well, an increased rate of force generation doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's a faster time to peak. You could still have, if the, if the time to peak were the same in the late activation as the early activation, yep. it would simply be delayed. So you won't have, a, you won't have synchronization unless the late activation reach this peak faster and then it can I suppose our, our argument was that, so we can go through like looking at the stress in different regions. This was a, an argument which I could take to a cardiologist that they could understand, uh, but also that it doesn't have to explain everything. It's about that it would mitigate the effects. So if you said, why was someone less likely to respond? If they had a healthy Frank Starling mechanism mm -hmm. and they met the criteria for CRT, then I mean they had a 35% ejection fraction and it potentially was not due to a as much dyssynchrony. So in that sense, we would say they were less likely to respond because there was some other pathological mechanism which was causing them to have that 35% ejection fraction as opposed to it just being a purely dyssynchronous feature, which is what CRT is going to be treating. Okay. So what would your computer model show for a healthy uh, Frank Starling relation? Does it show the synchrony and what's the mechanism for that within the model? So within the simulations, we personalized those to the individual patients, right. and we looked at what the sensitivity was, so we didn't have a gold standard reference for what was a healthy Frank Starling mechanism. We could say that we had a Frank Starling mechanism, if it was improved, these patients were less likely to benefit from CRT. If it was decreased, they were more likely to benefit from CRT. There was a question from East Baltimore, or not? Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Brian. Hi, Steve. Hi, Brian. How are you? Good, thank um, you. The, uh, the question I had was about the reduced model of, of atrial fibrillation. Uh, I was wondering about you know removing the calcium channel from that model because uh, it's, you know, it's thought that calcium channel restitution plays a major role in mechanisms of Entry, at least in the ventricle. So I wondered about that decision and whether you could comment on that. Yeah, so we, we looked at the problem as saying that the, we felt that the salient features that we wanted to capture were the conduction velocity restitution and the uh, action potential duration restitution. And that they were going to provide a reasonable representation for, or uh, could potentially explain, that level of detail could potentially explain the arrhythmias that we see in the atria. So we don't specify, specific, we don't have a, a hard specification as to what's causing those properties. So we have a model which will capture that conduction velocity restitution and that uh, rest, refractory period restitution, 
but we don't necessarily need to assign that specifically to a calcium channel or a potassium channel. So by reducing it down to just repolarization and depolarization, uh, we can constrain those parameters and effectively the effects of the calcium channel are then being lumped into the sodium channel representation of the N channel and the out channel. Okay. I have a question, Steve. Um, in, when you were showing us the correlation of fibrosis score that's done by the automatic segmentation yep. <coughs> software and done by the clinicians, is this just the burden? This is the total amount of That fibrosis. was the absolute value, yep. yes. Have you guys looked at the distribution and how well uh, an AI can do that? So, we haven't looked at it, but my expectation is that we would be reasonably close, and I say that because we know that the segmentations are so close. Mm -hmm. So because we have the, the process that the, the cardiologists, they do the segmentation, then they have to put points, not specifically, just kind of broadly where the pulmonary veins are and where the appendage is, and then everything else after that is still automated. So if we have a segmentation which is a very close match to the cardiologist's result and we put it through exactly the same workflow, then it would surprise me, happy to be surprised, but I would be surprised if the distribution was significantly different. And my second question is on one of your slides, I think he was potentially the mechanics, I'm uh, not quite remembering. You had a title, um, a rule-based EP. Yep. What does that mean? So, uh, so what we did was we wanted to look at what are some of the physiological mechanisms that we can include in our models that are required or increase the accuracy of their <coughs> predictions compared to invasive measurements. Mm -hmm. So we had, uh, I think, I want to say 14 uh, MRIs where we had late enhancement and also where we had epicardial uh, activation maps made uh, in Maastricht. And we knew where we were pacing because they were pacing in the right ventricles, so we knew where the activation was starting. And then we looked to see if we should, if we included septal slowing, a fast intercardial conduction layer, uh, anterior or posterior functional block, and uh, the effect of scar on the activation pattern. Which combination of those were most important for allowing a simple model which was fitted just to the ECG QRS duration? to replicate the epicardial activation measurements that we were making. And so we went through that, and essentially at the end of it, we found that the, the thing that was most important in the data that we collected was the fast endocardial conduction layer. So we would then, with a fixed ratio, and I cannot remember off the top of my head what that fixed ratio was uh, from the bulk myocardium conductivity, but that means if we add that in, though we don't have the data to support exactly what that will be, we anticipate that the predictions we'll get from the models will be closer to the um, what's actually happening uh, without actually having the, the full kind of body surface ECG or an invasive mapping system. But you're solving the problem on a surface then? Is that, am I understanding that? I know, it's a full, it's a full, full, it's a full ventricular. Yeah, full, full ventricular. Full ventricular. It was just that we, we had this, uh, kind of we had a training case and then we had four other patients that we got at St. Thomas's. We gave them CTs, we then gave epicardial activation maps from those and we then apply our rule-based method and see if we could then predict what those epicardial activation patterns would be just with an ECG and a CT and applying a few simple rules. And so this was a way that we can very quickly make models which obviously have some shortcomings, but we can make them with a very limited data set. Okay. All right, thank you. Other questions? All right, well, thank you, Steve. Thank Excellent. you very much. Thank you.